Uh, hey, Eric, how you doing? Uh, I guess just your your thoughts, first of all, on um, on Moses getting newcomer of the year and being first team and, and then J.D., after you talk about Moses, but, uh, J.D. getting a uh, sixth man. Yeah, no, I think it's an awesome accomplishment uh, for Moses, um, you know, to be recognized by, you know, the, 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 the coaches is phenomenal. Um, same thing with JD. I mean, you know, it's a, takes a special player to be willing to come off the bench, never complain, be able to come in and play the off guard or uh, the point guard. He's made great strides. JD has as a point guard and understanding shot selection and defending. And then with Moses, I mean, there's just not often that you have a, a freshman come in, start from day one, um, be a go-to player, be a guy that you rely on to make baskets, a guy that you rely on to get defensive stops, a player that you rely on uh, to guard every night. Uh, Moses has improved putting the ball on the deck, um, you know, beating people off, you know, isolation situations. Um, you know, he's always been a great spot up shooter, but I think he's really improved in some other areas as well. So, so much, much deserved. And Moses only has had four turnovers the last four games. I think he's only got 38 for the season or something like that. Um, what about, yeah. What about the way he takes care of the ball, especially of late? Yeah. I mean, he's done a great job of, cause he doesn't force things. He lets the game come to him. He's got an, an incredibly high basketball IQ. Um, so it's not, it's not really a surprise. And, and, um, you know, he just does a great job with ball security and, and, um, you know, that's also why he's, you know, got the ball in his hands a lot in late game situations as a decision maker and a shot maker. And he's, and he's also made, especially of late, I mean, he, he's, he's had a couple great no look passes, um, you know, so he's made some great, you know, extra passes without, without turning the ball over. I know earlier in the year, you, you talked a lot about you know, JD's got to have better shot selection. He needs to share the ball more. He needs to improve his defense. And he seems like he's really come a long way in all those areas and is playing his best ball of late. What have you thought about how he's taken to coaching, I guess? And, and I guess he's obviously doing what you want him to do, you know? No, he's been incredible just sitting down and, and going through film with, with, with people on the coaching staff and, um, you know, I text him all the time after games and, and, um, he's just receptive. He's like a sponge. He wants to get better. Uh, this is new to him. You know, he was, he was, a, he's been a scorer his whole life. Um, you know, he just kind of out there freelancing a lot and he's, you know, now playing much more into, in a team system and a team environment. And I think that, you know, his future is even going to grow more and more. Um, you know, not just as a guard, not just as an off guard, but also as a, as a point guard is, is his growth on both sides of the ball is, has, I don't know if I can remember a player in such a short time frame um, growing his game like, like JD has, because he's, you know, he started off, um, you know, with, with, with a lot of ceiling in a lot of areas like decision making shot selection when to pass all those type of things. And he's, and he's done a great job of, of getting better on a daily basis. Yeah. I got a couple more. I'll, I'll give it back to Mike if time allows. Thank you. Hey, Alan. Eric, just as far as Georgia and, and uh, Missouri, just what do you look for from, from either one of them as far as you're playing, what would be kind of the keys to both games? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, Nate, you know, this is like a self-scouting week, especially yesterday and today. It's it's a get better week. You know, how do we get better? Um, you know, I mean, we're trying to balance uh, Marion, our offense and our defense right now at this juncture of the season and understanding the two different philosophies uh, that Georgia and Missouri have. Um, you know, but I think it's a lot of, I don't know, like uh, re why are in the switchboard right now? Cause we, we don't really know who we're playing. So how do we, uh, you know, get ready for both teams and also kind of worry about ourselves. Um, you know, so I think that that's, you know, that's kind of where we're at. I mean, we're not focused on one team or, uh, you know, we're, we're, we took the top three players, you know, from each team yesterday, we're looking at the top three sets 
from both teams, the top two baseline of out of bounds plays. And then we're trying to, to mix in how we would look to attack offensively. Um, you know, I mean, interesting enough, it's like my son, Michael said the other day, it's like, my mind's like a slot machine. Cause right now I'm just, you know, my wheels are spinning all these different ways with both teams. And I got to just try to stay a, a little bit, you know, focused on, um, you know, not trying to get too much in with both teams. I mean, you know, how do we just kind of worry about, you know, our, our own team right now until we're sure who we play? Thank you. Phil Elson. None? Okay. Hutch? Yeah, Coach, kind of along those lines, you know, with Missouri, you played them twice and, you know, once without Justin for you and once without Tillman for them and, Georgia was so long ago, they seem to be playing better of late. So can you really use much from those scouting reports and preparations preparing for them previously, whenever you prepare for them this week? Yeah, I mean, I think Hutch, I mean, we, we've got to go back to the, you know, because there's still a lot of the personnel that is the same, but you're right, the identity of two very important, you know, players on each team, obviously Tillman, um, you know, such a focal point for Missouri. And, and it was a very tough matchup for us in game one. And certainly, you know, Justin makes us a completely different basketball team as well. And, um, you know, Georgia, um, you know, they have a freshman that's, that's really played well uh, that did not play against us. So they have a changing of personnel as well. So, uh, but I, I think you still got to go back and, and look at, you know, look at your game uh, or your games, you uh, uh, you know, against Missouri, the two and the one against Georgia. And then you've got to also look at like their last five games and kind of try to come up with some trends and, and philosophical things that you want to give your team. Uh, but we don't, we don't want to overload them either as, as, as we're getting ready to, you know, not knowing who we exactly play. Teresa Walker. Teresa. You're muted, Teresa. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, it's Zoom world today. Uh, Coach, you come into this tournament, uh, you know, doing so well in league play. How do you prepare for this tournament? Do you, you know, do you try to make a clean break of it to, to make sure that there's not maybe a little bit too much confidence or you just really like the way your team's been playing uh, in, in the SEC? Well, Teresa, I mean, we like how we're playing, obviously, but also, we, you know, we understand that each game has its own identity, has its own theme. Um, you know, I mean, we want more with this team. You know, we want more time with them. We want more games. We want more of everything. And the only way really from, from here on out, you know, with the SEC tournament, it's one game and done. And then you move to the next tournament, and it's the same thing. So, um, you know, one of our themes is how do we come up with more, um, you know, Am I worried about overconfidence? No. Um, you know, that's our job behind closed doors. Um, probably not going to be overconfident anyhow with the way the awards went today because we have some freshmen that, that um, I don't know how they were overlooked, but, but they were. Um, Justin Smith has been as important to our team as any player is to any team. Jalen Tate defensively. Uh, Vanover's one of the best shot blockers. I mean, we were left off the all defensive team. I think we're a pretty good defensive team. So I think they're, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't see why you'd be overconfident, um, especially with, 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 with how today went with, with some of the individual player awards and, and Mike Kaywood, you can remotely, uh, remotely re mute me at any point as well. Just to quickly follow, the best way to answer the, 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 the lack of awards and recognition to just go win the tournament title? No, I think we've already, I think we've, we've already answered that through a whole league play. I don't think it's going to really matter um, what we do. Um, the votes are already in. And um, I'm just shocked, you know, like I, I, I love to watch uh, post-game press conferences. And I mean, everybody, after every game, everybody talks about, this guy's a pro on our team and this guy's Gary Payton defense. Well, where are the votes? Um, cause, cause I hear all the press things and, you know, last year, everybody said Isaiah Joe was a pro and I could be wrong, but I don't think he was voted to either team either. So, you know, I'm a little confused on that, but 
you know, again, I, maybe I'm mishearing some of the postseason or post-game quotes by some of the opposing coaches after games. Scotty. Yeah, Coach, kind of along those same lines, is, is not landing – on the all SEC teams going to be fuel for, for a guy like Justin, or is he the kind of guy that's just going to let this thing kind of roll off of him? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I think Justin's so mature and I just knowing him as, as well as I don't think it affects him at all, to be honest. And, you know, thankfully the USA today recognized him. Um, you know, those guys must really study with the USA today, um, you know, to recognize him. So, um, but I, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think our guys are going to, you know, I'm sure today it'll, you know, whatever. And then I think that the bottom line is it's a team sport and it's how do you go win the next game? That's the, that's the thing that's most important. And I'm, I'm wondering if you might be able to provide a glimpse into maybe Devo's personality maybe some of the things that he does, you know, on or off the floor to, to kind of keep the mood light. I mean, for his personality, first of all, Scotty is insanely positive. Um, he's our energizer. I mean, um, I'm sure you, you know, everybody on this call has got Twitter. I mean, he's, he shoots late at night and I can promise you because I text early, early in the morning. And if I text three guys at six in the morning, two of the three hit me back at, you know, nine or 10 in the morning. If I text Devo at five 30 in the morning, he texts back at five 31. Now, I don't know, maybe he's got his volume up um, on his phone to, to, you know, to alert him, but I don't think so. I think this, I don't know when he sleeps. I mean, the kid is full of energy. Um, he's like a, a bright light when he walks in the gym, when he walks into our team meetings on the road. Um, I love being around him. His teammates love being around him. And then it's a reflection of how he plays. I mean, he's, he's the guy that, you know, if we're, you know, kind of walking in mud or, or we're leaking oil. I mean, he's kind of the guy that can, that can, that can, that can help uh, solve those problems for us just with his energy and his effort. Curtis. Hey, Coach, obviously ended the season on such a remarkable run, but at this time of year, you hear people talk about teams that are built to win in March, and your your team's been mentioned in that category as of late. What what do you think stands out about this group that makes them a, a team that's dangerous in postseason play? Well, I, you know, I, mean, I think, you know, we played really well during, the, you know, during a month when our, let's face the facts, you know, when this, you know, streak started, our backs were against the wall. Um, you know, it wasn't too long ago where, where we were just fighting for an NCAA tournament berth. Um, you know, after we lost to Alabama, uh, you know, we were probably right in that range of, I don't know, first four in, first four out. Um, and we understood that as a, as a group that we had set some preseason goals and and those were in jeopardy if we didn't if we didn't start playing better basketball and playing with a little bit more sense of urgency. Uh, and we turned the corner uh, with you know with our play and and uh, well, with our confidence as well. Uh, but it's a whole like it's a one in you know it's like I've mentioned at least you got to go win the next game in front of you. Um, you know the good thing is like we know we're in the NCAA tournament. Sure, we want to try to get as good a seat as we can because that's only logical. Um, but we also, you know, we've got to understand too that, um, you know, sometimes shots don't fall and sometimes they do fall. And, and you know, I mean, for instance, the other day against Texas a and I mean, their shots were falling. I mean, we've gone back and watched video. Like, I mean, they made some tough shots that, they got some momentum going and, and uh, we defended some of the shots in the second half really well. And sometimes you run into that. And that's why you see upsets every year, year after year, after year, after year, after year. And um, we just want to continue uh, playing excellent team basketball where we're sharing the ball and we're defending with great energy. That's all that I think we can really control. Kevin. 
preseason, one of the couple of the points you talked about as being areas of concern were lack of lateral mobility, but also who's going to be the go-to guy. With the kind of success you've had at the end of the season, it seems like multiple players have proven to be go-to guys, whether it's offense or on defense getting a stop. As you move in the postseason, uh, win or go home, uh, are you comfortable with the, your go-to guys? And can you talk a little bit about that, uh, how that's emerged over the course of the season? Yeah, Kevin, I think that, uh, you know, we've had so many different leading scores, and I think it's because we've done a really good job of sharing the basketball. And I think when you share the basketball, that means you respect the defense. So, um, you know, if, if somebody's over helping on one player, then you, you know, you turn uh, one shot into a better shot for a teammate and you don't force shots. I, I mean, there's no secret really that Moses is our go-to player, but that doesn't mean your go-to player uh, necessarily has to take shots. It might be some of the passes that have been made. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, mobility. I think our guys have gotten better defensively and a lot of that too, um, Kevin, our defensive, you know, mobility laterally has really improved with, with Devo Davis. Um, his lateral uh, foot speed, his lateral quickness and his ability to get to loose balls and rebounds for his area has really helped us. So, and then, and then I think that JD has stepped up, you know, from a defensive standpoint, from where he was early in the year, you know, we didn't feel like he was getting low enough um, defensively. And I think as, as of late, he's bending his knees more as simple as that sounds, and he's got way more active hands. So I think, you know, kind of that two part question, Kevin, of the, the defensive mobility, as well as like a go to player um, with your go to player. I really think like you want the ball to have eyes and find the open guy. And then you've got to trust that open guy because some nights, you know, we posted Jalen Williams up against Alabama when we needed baskets and we've, you know, we've gone to Moses off single double screens and JD Note has been in uh, isolation situations. We've had games where we've posted the, you know, Justin Smith and we've had games where we're struggling uh, and Devo Davis breaks off plays with his, you know, with, with his bounce game and, and Desi played so well at South Carolina knocking three. So I think there's just, the great thing about this team is we're, we're not one dimensional on, on either side of the basketball. Follow up question for you. You've talked a lot at different times about identity of basketball teams, but it seems like with your game planning and figuring out personnel matchups game to game, you're able to shape shift who you guys are. So when you're in postseason play and you talked about the hurdles of trying to, who are you going to play? You don't know your game planning. Doesn't it also make Arkansas a tough matchup for other teams, given that, on any given night, you're a three-point shooting team or you're better defensively. Uh, and you can actually, even in-game, change what the, what the team style of play is. Well, I, I think, Kevin, that, you know, just because of how we do practices and, and um, you know, I've, there's just kind of these two different worlds of coaching. There's um, the thought process of, of, you know, this is who we are. This is how we play every night. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time on the opposing team. We only spend time. That's not who we are. We're more, and I've, I've said it before, and I don't mean to continue to, but we're more under the Patriots line of thinking with New England where you try to game plan for that particular game. And then I, I also do think that um, maybe a little bit different than traditional um, college basketball or, or maybe if coaches came from high school and then worked their way up to the college ranks, um, the NBA is just different. Um, the background that I've been surrounded watching my dad and, and then spending like it's all about mismatches and trying to find a mismatch. Um, you know, and you see it in football. Some teams, you know, you try to get a taller wide receiver to go against a smaller defensive back or smaller cornerback. And so for us, that's why some nights we post up Justin Smith. And then that's some nights where we see a you know, a hole and maybe Jalen Williams is the guy down low and, and, uh, or we might, you know, want to ISO JD Note because, because of, the, because of the matchup that he has. So I think that um, we do have a lot of different identities to play with. And, and I do think that that does make us a little bit more difficult to scout, but I'm also smart enough to know that from here on out, um, 
it's kind of a make or miss game. And if you, if you miss and the other team's making, you get eliminated. Um, but, but I do think, you know, our guys are used to making halftime adjustments. Our players are, where we can come in and completely change a pick and roll coverage if we need be. And, and they're not shell shocked by drastic changes from game to game, or even, you know, maybe even at halftime sometimes. Congratulations on a great season. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Randy. Eric, by the way, for what it's worth, had Devo on this past summer, I asked him what he wanted to do in college. He wanted to major in zoology. He wants to own a zoo after his playing days are over. So for what it's worth. Uh, you kind of touched on this earlier. And I, by the way, Randy, I knew that. We do a little thing called Voices and Choices at all of our road team meals and everybody gets up. And one of the questions a few weeks ago, we did ask, what do you want to do when you're done playing? And Devo brought up that he'd like to own a zoo. Um, I asked him what his favorite animal was. He brought up a whale. Um, I asked him if he had ever seen a whale being from Little Rock. He had not. Um, I proceeded to tell him about when I was younger, my mother used to take me whale watching in the Pacific Ocean at least once a summer from a very young age. So I, I, I let him know about my whale watching experience. So true team bonding. You're one up on him then. Uh, you talked a little bit about this, but I'm sure between the game uh, that concluded against South Carolina until you play, you're going to mix in some self scouting upon yourself. If you've had a chance to do that, what areas do you see that you need to work on and what areas do you see that you need to enhance upon? That's a great question, Randy. And I feel like I'm overly upfront and honest with you guys, but that's one I'd like to withhold because I don't, I don't know who might watch this thing later on. So I, I don't want coach Crane or coach Martin to watch it and for them to know what we think our holes are. We got some holes. I can tell you that. Um, but I'll probably just keep those between me and the, me and the, me and the guys. Well, you can email them to me then if, if that's okay. <laughs> I'll come on your radio show again and tell you the whole <laughs> Thank you, coach. Thanks. Jason Carroll. Coach, you mentioned backs against the walls with that two and four start. I wonder what the mentality was like with you and the rest of the coaches at that point to, to get the team to, to change the direction it was going. And with that, give you a chance to say why you should have been coach of the year with that 11 straight conference wins down the stretch to get your team to where you are now. Do you think you may have been overlooked with what you guys did the last month of the season? No, I mean, the, the only coach of the year award that I'm really uh, pissed off about is, is uh, when I lost out to Greg Popovich because there was a large bonus, um, but a large bonus. So that one, Jason, I'm mad about. Um, it still irks at me, um, cause a lot of money was left on the table, man. Um, this one, not so much. I'm more worried about our player awards than I'm, I'm 57. I don't really need them, but that, that NBA one a few years ago when I was a lot younger, I could have invested, made some good investments with that money that, and then the other one that irked me was, uh, Nick Nurse. Uh, I, cause I actually had a bet with four or five different NBA GMs before the G league season started that I was going to win G league coach of the year. Uh, some of the guys that are buddies of mine or I worked with that was, and I lost out to Nick. I don't know how that those two, not this one, but those two really pissed me off, Jason. Um, this one, none. Uh, the other question about our backs being against the wall, um, we, I mean, we, I think I've told you guys, like, we had a really brutal practice uh, after the LSU game. Um, we pride ourselves on being a team that really, really plays hard, and it's not going to happen every night. You know, when you play 27 games or you play 30, you know, games, and, and I kind of, you know, in the NBA, you probably have, you know, five to eight of those a year where you just – you don't have your legs, the other team's rolling – you're struggling and you just stink. And that happens over 82 games. And I kind of found, um, you know, in the four years that I was at Nevada, that usually two times a year in college, you just stink. You know, the other team's rolling, you're tired, the schedule is such that 
you know, it's, you know, you're just not going to win. And um, ours happen to be back to back this year. Um, and your team can go two ways. It really can. Like, I'm not sure the whole staff thought that we should bring out weighted vests and, and, and uh, close out with bricks in our hands. Um, I wanted to go with an overload principle because I've seen my dad do it. Um, but it, there was a risk too, you know, that, that the guys, you know, we have so many new faces. There, it wasn't risky when I did that at Nevada after, you know, three or four years, cause we all knew each other inside and out. But I think at that point, um, they, the team really decided to fully buy in. Um, and, and there was nobody with half a foot out. I mean, it was, it was all in at that point. Um, or it would have just been miserable for everybody if we would have kept going down that road because practices weren't going to get easier. Um, but I just think that the guys really, you know, we believed in them too. Sometimes when you have that type of practice and you're telling them throughout a grueling practice, hey, the reason we're doing this, I, we believe in you. We, we, we expected more. We expected to go to Baton Rouge and play well. We expected to go to – Tuscaloosa, it's not okay to play the way we, we, we have too much talent in this room. We have all league guys. We got to play better. And, um, you know, I just thought that, that they, you know, turn the corner as a group from a confidence standpoint as well. Great show. Coach, obviously going to Nashville, it's not going to be a full arena and you were able to, you know, kind of create some energy there in Bud Walton and it not being full. How do you create some energy in Nashville when it's not going to be a full arena? And you will have some fans there, but there won't be, you know, the typical SEC tournament crowd. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, Trey, like, I, I think we're pretty used to it now. I mean, the, the one game that was just weird to me was when we walked out at Auburn, the first SEC game. It was it was surreal. I remember turning around to my son, Michael, and said, this is, you know, this, just diff, you know, like something I'd never experienced in college. It was, I mean, it was like a G League game, in you know, in a in a city that maybe didn't draw. Um, but I think now we're all used to it. I really do, Trey. I don't, you know, I, I mean, one of the things is, you know, like when we get to Nashville and we get to the NCAA tournament, like we can't win a game in the first ten minutes. You know, we 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 can't win a game in the first ten minutes of the second half. You know, I mean. You're going to have to win games now in the last two minutes of the game a lot of times because there's going to be a lot of close games from here on out. And I don't think you can, re you know, rely on external um, motivation with the crowd because it's just not going to be there. Um, it's it's going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be different environment, not just in Nashville, but also in the NCAA tournament because obviously those crowds, at least the ones I've been a part of, have been, you know, incredible – buildings full of energy and anticipation and you could cut it with a knife in the air two hours before tip off. And that's not the type of environments that we're going to be playing in, in the middle of a pandemic. Okay, coach, I appreciate your time. I know you got to get to practice. Sorry. A couple guys got the cut off there at the end, but, uh,